Good morning, everybody. This is David and Sue. I'm known as LDS Prepper. This is my sweetheart, and she is known as the Backyard Herbalist. And she'll talk more about that and her website uh, in the presentation today. But we're very excited to have you here. We see we already have a lot of people very excited to hear from Sue today and for her to share her experience and knowledge with herbs. She's very, very knowledgeable. Um, she'll forget more about herbs than I'll ever know or understand. Uh, a lot of people come to her with questions about herbs. She'll mention she's not a doctor. She's not going to give any medical advice. She'll, she'll share experiences that she's had and others have and hopefully help you identify really the medicinal weeds that are growing in your property or around your house or between the cra or in the cracks in your sidewalk and uh, help you take advantage of what's already there, what's really be uh, beneath your feet that could really be b blessing you and your family. So uh, she's my guest on ldsprepper.com. That's my YouTube channel. So if you're finding us uh, somewhere else, then just come over to ldsprepper.com. Uh, just give you an update. Earlier this week, I did an update on my quail. I'm growing Coterni's quail. I'm, they're actually in the incubator right now. Uh, in addition to the ones that are, I've had for a year. I, uh, so I talked about the incubator. I talked about the, the automatic watering system with that. I had another video with my twin sister when we were in the backyard. We were having some fun with uh, mini uh, crossbows. Uh, that was fun. So lots of different things here on the homestead. It's uh, just after 9 o'clock. I've been up. I've fed the cat. We have a mouser that lives outside. Uh, I've uh, fed the quail. I went and got some uh, broccoli leaves. I, uh, I brought, harvested the broccoli from the geothermal greenhouse this, um, this week. To get some broccoli leaves from the plants, gave those to the quail. Brought in the firewood from under the solar panels, stacked that up, split the wood for the kin tinder and the kindling. Sue's been out feeding the chickens this morning, so it's a normal Saturday morning here on the Gilmore Homestead here in southeast Idaho. So uh, I, w I did want to bring you up to date. Last week we talked about the Fortress Home Security System. Uh, you can get the best price available at ldsprepper.com slash fortress. I did talk to them again this week. They don't have a special discount code or anything for me yet, uh, so, but because they said it would cost too much to, to put that together. So go use that, use that link, but uh, when you, when you go there, uh, also, uh, they have the base system available there, but I also recommend that you make sure that you get this uh, uh, additional item, which is a, an external siren. And this is very, very loud. You want to make as much noise and as much light uh, as possible when someone breaks into your home or you have an intruder. This is the system that I have that we discussed. You'll see more detail on that from my last week's broadcast. That's the uh, S03 or S03 security system from Fortress. So uh, if you're interested in getting that uh, or learning more about that, look at that video from last week's uh, live broadcast. Anyway, I see lots of comments here. Good morning, everybody. We just can't take time to say hello to everybody, but just let, uh, just let you know we're very excited to have you here and we know why you're here. That's to listen to Sue, not to me. So let me turn the time over to Sue. I'll be over here on the side monitoring and hopefully we'll have, uh, she can get through this presentation uh, effectively and we can get to some of your questions. So if you have any questions, please write those down here in the, in the chat. To help us identify a question, if you'll just write the word in all bold, question, because we're just going to skip all the comments here because you guys are you know, uh, chatting with each other. Just put the all bold question and then... Um, uh, write down your question or you all bold Sue and then we will be able to identify that quickly. So with no further ado, here is uh, my wife, a certified master herbalist, certified family herbalist, certified nutritional, nutritional herbalist. She's, uh, she's the go-to person for herbs. So thank you very much for being here. I'm going to be the tech guy and we are now going to bring this, uh, by the way, if anybody is familiar with the software, uh, I think it's OBS on present presentations. 
let me know because I'm learning how to do this. So uh, I'll get this screen set up. All right, so this is, they're seeing you down here in the corner and they're seeing your slides up here. Okay, how do I change slides? I just press the up and down button right here. All right, here she is. Okay, first off, gotta let you know I'm not a licensed physician or a health practitioner. The information that I share with you today is for education and entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Always seek the advice of a qualified medical professional before using herbs therapeutically. Herbs and pharmaceuticals do interact and it's always a good idea to run any herbal therapy that you want to use by your professional health care professional. Uh, make sure that it's not going to, the, the interaction is not going to be harmful. The My Master Herbalist coursework required me to learn the healing properties and medicinal actions for about a hundred herbs. I had memorized the common name, the Latin name, primary health benefit. I had to be able to recognize the plants from a plant pressing. And that was all just very daunting, a hundred herbs. And when I passed my uh, final exams I, and started talking to people in the area, I found that a lot of people just really want to know, hey, what grows here that I can use medicinally? And I found that not all of the hundred herbs that I had learned grow here or can be grown here. And so I started looking into what does grow here and I found a huge apothecary in my backyard. I think I, in this whole area, I identified a hundred additional herbs in addition to those that I had learned and 70 of those were growing on our own property. So there is a lot that you can draw from here in the Was on the Wasatch Front. And, and a lot of these turned out to be common weeds that are found not only here in southeastern Idaho, but throughout the world. So it doesn't really matter too much where you live. A lot of these were, weeds are going to be common to where you live too. So to make it easy to to learn about these plants, I divided those 100 plants that I found into five different categories. And I'll be covering the medicinal weeds today, 20 common backyard weeds that have extraordinary health benefits. All of the information that I found, I put into a reference manual so that I could have that information at my fingertips, because there's no way it anybody can remember everything about the thousands of plants on this planet that have medicinal and value and health benefits. So I created these reference manuals and then found that there were lots of people interested in that information and so I have published them and made them available for purchase on ldsprepperstore.com. So all of the information from all of the information that I included in my reference manuals comes from reputable herbal sources, resources that I use during my master herbalist coursework, other herbalists that have published information, and that gave me a good barometer for looking on the internet and finding out what there is also reputable. A lot of it is not. A lot of people with blogs just copy and paste plagiarize copy and paste from other people's in online information so the the reference manuals you can be sure that the information is reputable you know somebody was out in left field or in, out in space with their information i did not include that each reference manual has a glossary of the herbal terms that I use to help you become familiar with those herbal actions. It's the lingo of herbalists, and it's a whole lot easier to say uh, this, 
plant is an alterative and other herbalists understand exactly what that means. So there's a glossary there to help you become familiar with that terminology and understand with one word, you know, kind of a whole big picture about what that plant can do. There, there's also a couple of uh, quick reference guides. So you can look up the plants and get a list of their medicinal qualities at a glance, or you can look up specific health issues and then see the plants that uh, are good for that, that uh, health issue. I, I use my reference manuals all the time because I can't remember everything that I've learned and it's uh, just a good go-to place for getting started with becoming familiar with the herbs. So let's get started. First, and these are just in alphabetical order. They're not in um, any kind of preferential order. Amaranth is a common annual weed that grows prolifically in this area. It is, it's what we call an astringent herb, which means that it will dry tissues up, it will tighten and tone tissues that have become loosey-goosey and kind of lax. It is also highly nutri uh, nutritional, has lots of good vitamins and minerals in it. And those vitamins and minerals have health benefits. Astringent herbs, uh, for an example of what you would use those for, uh, diarrhea, very watery. Um, astringent herbs help stop diarrhea. And astringent herbs are really good for like uh, heavy menstrual bleeding. L uh, fluids that are leaking from the body, a profuse amount of fluids. Astringent herbs tighten things up and get things back to normal. Second on the list is burdock. Burdock, I, I've listed here, it's a blood purifier. Actually, your liver is the blood purifier in your body. Uh, so burdock stimulates the liver to do its job, increases its function, helps it do its job better. The seeds are the, the seeds in the root are the medicine. Diuretic herbs, like it says on the slide, makes you pee. Uh, diuretic plants are, they are fluid releasers. So when you are retaining water and fluids, diuretic herbs help get those fluids. They draw fluids out of the cells of the body, send them to the kidneys, they get filtered, and then sent out of the body. Burdock is just, a, it's a really good herb for helping the liver and your kidneys. Burdock is a, what's called a biennial weed. That means its lifespan spans two years. The first year it comes up, it forms a basal rosette of these heart-shaped leaves, and it sends a really long taproot down into the ground. The second year it grows a, a flower stalk, goes to flower, goes to seed, reproduces. So it has a, a two-year life cycle. The, the roots are actually cultivated in, a, in the Asian countries. They're called gobo in Japan. These have been cultivated for uh, the, the grocery markets. They are used in um, soups and stir fries all the time in, in, in Asia. So it's a really good edible plant as well as a medicinal plant. And anytime that you can incorporate um, a plant into your daily meals, the better for your health. The roots are harvested in the fall of the first year or the early spring of the second year to use either medicinally or for culinary purposes. 
This is on the left is a picture of what burdock looks like during the second year. You can see, I really think these purple thistle-like flowers are quite stunning. Uh, the once they start, once the thistle starts to dry, the bracts on the the top of the thistle become like Velcro. I still I have a fleece vest. I happen to brush up an early winter against a dried burdock plant and the bracts <coughs> clung to that fleece and I still have not been able to get them out. So stronger than Velcro. Um, you might find this plant easily collects in the fur of dogs and other small animals that come in contact with those uh, thistles. Seed and the roots are the medicine, really good plant to have on your property. Just don't de get too close to it. Next up is chickweed. I have some really great stories to tell about chickweed, but not enough time today to refer to them. I do share those in my herbal reference manual. Um, so chickweed is a good blood and lymph purifier, which just means that it helps the liver and the kidneys do their jobs better at removing toxins and cellular met metabolic wastes from the blood. I have found in my experience that whenever, as an herbalist, when somebody is having skin eruption issues, or which just means that the liver is not doing its job very well, most herbalists turn to the, the blood purifying herbs, the herbs that are good for the liver, and overlook the lymph system, which is connected to the circulatory system. They work together when you've got infections or a lot of uh, cellular and toxic wastes that you're trying to detoxify. So it's always good to remember when you've got an infection, not to overlook the, the herbs that help remove blockages in the lymphatic system. Chickweed is also a really good dissolvent, and that means that it helps get nutrients inside of cells and waste products outside of cells, including fat cells. So if you're trying to lose weight, chickweed can help that process of getting, dissolving the fat, getting out, getting it out through the cell walls into the bloodstream and out through the elimination channels. In my herbal reference manuals, um, but especially on my website, I have focused a lot on how to identify these plants. And um, chickweed has some plants that are look alike, so it can be, you can easily confuse chickweed with some of the other weeds that are out there. So if you'll take a stem of chickweed and hold it between your two fingers and just slowly start to pull that stem apart, you'll see, if it's chickweed, you'll see this kind of elastic filament inside of the stem, and that's your clue, one of the best clues that you've got chickweed and not something else. So I have just, over the last year, started a website that has a lot of this introductory material about the herbs in my reference manuals, and a lot more detail about how to identify these plants. It's really important to be able to identify these weeds and plants correctly because they do have look-alikes that can kill you if you're not 150 percent sure of what you're looking at. So my website has good descriptions of how to identify the the, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, the roots, the seeds, all parts of the plant, how it grows, and then it has information on some of the, the look-alikes so that you can distinguish between what is medicinal and what is not. 
Cleavers, this is a really good lymphatic herb, weed. It, let's see, this one, it kind of, it creeps along the ground and it can get, the, the stems can get six or seven feet long. If it has something to uh, climb on, it's very um, sticky in that it has, it's, it's like burdock and it has these little, uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, bracts that cling and it will climb up a fence post, it'll climb up a fence, it'll climb up a trellis if you have it. So if you can grow this vertically in your yard, that's a good way to keep it from sprawling out six or seven feet and just grow it straight up. The aerial portions are the medicine, the leaves, the stems, the flowers. It is an edible plant, however, it is bitter and most people don't like bitter. But anything bitter typically tends to be really good for your liver and stimulates all of the, the, the whole the timing of the digestive process. So really good to have some bitter herbs on hand. It's also astringent, which will help tighten loose tissues, help with diarrhea, excess fluids. The seeds of cleavers make for a good coffee substitute if you like to drink coffee. However, you're going to need to plant a very big patch of cleavers if you want to get enough seeds from these plants to, to make coffee. Next up is Crane's Bill. And the next, the next one is Stork's Bill. These plants do not look alike, but their names are so kind of familiar, similar and so I had a hard time in the beginning you know looking at this plant okay was this crane's bill or was it stork's bill because the names are so similar so I have since started calling crane's bill wild geranium because it is a wild geranium and that has helped me kind of distinguish between crane's bill and stork's bill crane's bill is really really high in tannins Tannin is a plant compound that is used to tan leather animal hides. It's a very strong astringent. It is also really good at stopping bleeding. The, the roots, parts used, the underground rhizome. A rhizome is an underground root that kind of creeps along and starts a new plant. It creeps along and it starts a new plant. So the rhizome is the medicine. The leaves are also medicinal. It is astringent because it's very high in tannins and that property is what gives it its ability to stop bleeding. Stork's bill, if you look at the plant for a you know, bird's eye view, looking down on the plant, the leaves are the big telltale difference uh, the, the wild geranium leaves look like geranium plants. The, the stork's bill leaves are more feathery. They're actually um, edible, uh, kind of tastes like parsley. So you can put them in salads, you can use them as a pot herb, you can put them in smoothies. Um, the, the flowers are very different. Stork's bill flower is very small, has five pinkish, purplish, flower petals and if you look real close three of those petals will be a little bit bigger than the other two. Um, Stork's bill has very similar uh, medicinal properties. It is hemostatic because it does have tannins. Not as much as the wild geranium but it does have some tannins in it which makes it astringent and help, uh, good for controlling bleeding. It's also a really good diuretic which helps you get excess fluids out of the body. So if you're retaining water, you have uh, edema, lymphedema, fluids that are stuck in the lymph system or somewhere in the body, Stork's Bill will help pull those fluids out through the kidneys and help you eliminate them. Don't know if I need to 
describe dandelions. I think we all have a good idea of what dandelions are, but they're very medicinal. The roots are specific for the liver. The leaves are specific for the kidneys. So the roots um, will help detoxify the bloodstream of cellular and metabolic wastes as well as the environmental toxins that bombard us. The, the leaves are a good diuretic, so they help the, the kidneys get rid of excess fluids from the body. The blossoms, if you've ever gotten an upset stomach, like after a big Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner or some big family gathering, family reunion, uh, you, you get an upset stomach when you don't have enough digestive enzymes to digest what you've eaten. The blossoms, if you've got dried blossoms on hand or, uh, if, you know, springtime, you can go out and just eat some of the blossoms. That will resolve the upset stomach, stimulate the pancreas to produce digestive enzymes and help you not feel so bad. Dandelion has several lookalikes. The best way to tell if it's a dandelion plant or something else is by the leaves. The, the leaves, in, in French, this plant is called dent de lion or tooth of the lion. And the leaves are, are what gave it that name because the leaves have really sharp, jagged points that point down towards the center of the basal rosette of the plant. And that's the best way to tell that this is a dandelion plant and not a lookalike. So remember, tooth of the lion, dent de lion, that's your big identifier. This is cat's ear. It is a lookalike when it is in flower. Dandelion is an early spring weed. Cat's ear is an early summer weed. So by the time the dandelions are gone, cat's ear is just starting to flower. And, and that's where it becomes confusing because the flowers look very similar. And I've taken people on plant walks just around my own property and I'll stop by a cat's ear and say, is this a dandelion or something else? And most everybody says, oh, that's dandelion. And it's a really good opportunity for me to point out that it looks like dandelion, but it's really cat's ear. And you can see that the leaves are, are quite different. Cat's ear leaves have a, a, a lobe, a rounded lobe at the top. They are pr more prickly and they're hairy. So very different, but the flowers do look alike. And that can be confusing if you're not aware that these two plants are look alike. The good thing is that if you mistake cat's ear for dandelion and you harvest it for medicine, it's not going to do you any harm. But dandelion, um, it's a really good medicinal to have on hand. You can use the flowers, the leaves, the roots. You can put the leaves in salad greens. Dandelion plants are cultivated in Europe for their greens. You can use them as a pot herb. The roasted root is another coffee substitute. So you could uh, make a tea with the roots if you really like the flavor of coffee but want to get away from the caffeine. Dandelion root is a good substitute. The flower stem of dandelion is hollow and when you break it, it exudes a white milky sap. Plants that exude a white milky sap which, it can, which contains latex, tend to be really good for getting rid of warts. So if you've got pesky warts that you know, nothing else has worked, give dandelion or some of the other milky sap weeds a try and see if that helps. You have to apply the milky sap on a regular basis over an extended period of time because warts are really um, tenacious. They're not easily gotten rid of. The young leaves of dandelions are not as bitter as the older leaves. As the plant matures, the older leaves do tend to become tougher and more bitter. 
So if you want to use leaves, add the leaves into your meals, get the, the young leaves when the plant is young and those will be less bitter. Gumweed is sometimes it's called curly cup. You can see the both the flower and the the flower bud in this photo. The bud is actually it's full of a very sticky resinous gum and that's what gives the plant the the name gumweed. The the gum is actually that resin is actually the medicine. This plant can grow either as a biennial over a two year period of time or it can be a perennial, um, which just, it comes up every year. And <clears throat> it is very drought tolerant, so it doesn't need a lot of water in order to flourish. I actually transplanted some gumweed into one of my herb boxes and it was getting watered every day and it just died. So it likes to be dry. And so this makes it really good for the back 40, if you've got a back 40. Let it, you know, plant it out there where it's not going to get watered on a regular basis. It does really well with just seasonal moisture. Gumweed is a really good expectorant, which means it helps loosen up uh, congested mucus secretions in the lungs. and <clears throat> helps you cough that up. So expectorants do not suppress coughing. They make your coughing productive so that you can get out the nasties that your body's trying to get rid of. Big difference. Uh, gumweed is also an antispasmodic, which means it's, it relaxes the bronchioles in your lungs. So this makes it perfect for those who have asthma, relaxes the bronchioles, and helps get out what is stuck in the lungs. The leaves can be used, the flowers and uh, the, the flower buds are medicinal. The flower buds have the most potent uh, medicine. You can, it's a very bitter plant, you can use bitter, bitter plants are really good for stimulating the digestive process, the whole timing of the release of secretions in the digestive process stimulates peristalsis, which is the movement of the muscles that move your food along and out through the bowel. That's really, bitters are really good for that whole process. Gumweed is very, very bitter. Uh, so if you don't mind that extreme bitterness, it's a, it's a good bitter. There are other herbs that are We'll do the same thing that are not quite as strong. Lamb's quarters is very, it's a cousin of amaranth. So the, when the plants are young, especially when they're just little seedlings, very hard to tell which is which. Lamb's quarters is really high in nutrients, so, so is amaranth, but the, the lamb's quarter leaves, when you look at them, especially when they're young, it looks like they're covered in a white dust. And that reflects its high mineral content. And um, amaranth, which is sometimes called pigweed, um, well, the pigweed, you can see kind of a pinkish tint at the base of the stem uh, where the, the root starts to become pink. Lamb's quarter does not have that pink cash. So that's how you tell the difference between these two plants. But both are really good uh, nutritive weeds. I have, I actually weeded this plant out of my garden before I learned that it is so good medicinally as well as nutritively. It is a gentle detoxifier. So if uh, you just like to help the detoxification process in your body on a regular basis, because this has a gentle, mild action, uh, you, you, it, it is edible. It's a good spinach substitute. Actually, when spinach is dying off because of the heat, lamb's quarter is just coming on. 
So when the spinach is out of the garden, you can harvest the lamb's quarter leaves and use them as salad greens or uh, smoothies. Uh, you can put it in soups, uh, use it as a pot herb, use it as a stir fry. Any way that you would use spinach, you can use lamb's quarters in the same way, the leaves in the same way. Lamb's quarters is astringent. That means it's going to help tighten and tone loose tissues. It helps with diarrhea, bleeding, that sort of thing. This is mallow. Perhaps you grew up knowing this plant as the cheesies plant because the, <clears throat> the seed pods, when you peel back the outer sepals, the seed pods resemble little whorls of cheese. Totally edible, so if you ate them you're, and you're still alive, I mean, you don't have to worry about your kids getting the idea that they can eat the, the little cheesies off the plant. It's not gonna harm them, actually. It's a really good medicinal. The, the most potent medicine for mallow is in its root. If you've ever tried to get rid of this plant from your garden, it is a, <coughs> it is a bear to get rid of because it has a very long tap root. The plant can, the young plant can be uh, rather small looking on top and have a really long uh, tap root. It is hard to get out. The trick, um, a few years ago I did an herbal presentation locally and this was in early fall. So I had a, a plant that was maybe 24 inches in diameter and the trick to getting the root out is to take a gallon of water and slowly pour it at the crown, at the crown of the, the plant where the root meets the leaves and just very s slowly pour that water. That water will, it will spread, but a lot of it will follow that tap root down into the ground. And then you can take as, um, what do you call it? A, it's not, it's not, a, not a shovel, but a spade, a, a fork tool and just start to loosen the soil around the base of the plant and and when you give it a gentle pull if the water has been able to go all the way down to the base of the root you should be able to pull that up it has some resistance but with patience you can pull that whole plant out by its root and that 24 inch wide cheesy plant had a tap root that was about 36 42 inches long it was very long. Um, lots of medicine in that root. There's a reason why you know some of these weeds are very tenacious is because they are saying in essence I've got good medicine don't get rid of me. Figure out what I can do for you and use me. So uh, if you want to get the the root for its medicine that's the trick to do it. Just pour water slowly down, let it trickle down that tap root, and then start to loosen the soil around the base of the plant, and then gently pull it until you can get it out with, uh, with the root intact. And if it does break off, no biggie. If it's not too deep, that plant will grow back next year. So you've always got mallow coming back. Mallow is full of what's called mucilage. Mucilage is a slimy, watery substance that is very soothing to mucous membrane. So very soothing to the digestive tract, very soothing to the respiratory tract, very soothing to the urinary tract, very soothing um, in the, the reproductive tissues. Soothing and anti-inflammatory. So anytime there's irritation in the respiratory system, the digestive system, any of those mucosal systems, demulcent herbs are just very soothing. Dr. Christopher used the whole plant to reverse gangrene. Some of his stories are truly amazing uh, where he was able to save 
the limbs of people who had um, were so infected that gangrene had set in uh, so that they didn't lose those limbs. So very powerful plant medicine, very good plant to have on hand. You might consider you know, thinking twice about weeding that out of your, your back 40 or your, where the weeds grow. The, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, actually I heard that the flowers are really good for toothache. If you, just, if you take a flower or a flower bud and put it on a tooth that's giving you some pain, it helps to numb the pain until you can get to your dentist to figure out what's going on. Uh, the leaves are good in smoothies. Uh, if, you, if you juice the leaves, and let it sit for a while, that juice is gonna to start to thicken up. That's the, the mucilage of, of the plant. It's very soothing. It's good to, good to put that in, in uh, smoothies. You can add the leaves to your, to your salads too if you want. And the fruits can actually be made like um, capers. If you like capers, you can, you can use those little cheesies and make your own medicinal capers. This is milk thistle. If you go online and uh, just do a Google search for milk thistle, sometimes you'll get a picture of a milk thistle, sometimes you'll get a picture of a European thistle, sometimes you'll get a picture of a musk thistle. This plant is easily misidentified all over the internet. So the way you identify milk thistle is by looking at the leaves. It looks like somebody spilled a glass of milk onto the plant and the leaves collect, or the, the milk collected in the veins. So it's got this milky white veining in the leaves and that is the biggest identifier because the, the actual purple thistle looks like a lot of other purple thistle weeds and can easily be confused. Um, fortunately, most of the thistles are edible. Some do have medicine. So if you do mistake milk thistle for another thistle plant, uh, it's not going to harm you, but you will not get the same benefits from a look-alike as you will from actual milk thistle. Milk thistle, the seeds are the medicine one of the best liver detoxification plants and it uh, not just helps with detoxification but helps strengthen the liver organ itself. So if you've got a sluggish liver, milk this is going to help restore that to its proper function. It is uh, <clears throat> protective of the liver. It is, the seeds are the only known antidote for death cap mushroom poisoning. So if you are into wild crafting mushrooms and mistakenly eat a death cap mushroom or one of your kids does, it's a good idea to have the milk thistle seeds have a tincture on hand uh, because it is the only known remedy for that poisoning. Mullen. Mullen is all over the, well, I've noticed that as I've come to learn about these weeds, now I see them everywhere and that's kind of fun. Whereas before I just didn't really notice them as like, now I see mullen everywhere. Likes to grow near irrigation ditches. We have lots of irrigation ditches here in southeastern Idaho along the Snake River. So this plant is easy to identify because of its tall flower stalk and it has these little tiny yellow flowers that open up uh, sequentially along the flower stalk. The, the flowers are me uh, medicinal. The, the leaves and the roots are also medicinal. The flowers made into an oil infusion are really good for earaches. 
The, the leaves itself are good for respiratory issues. Uh, my daughter called me once and said her friend um, had, this had this dry, hacking cough. And, if, and my daughter said, Dean, you know, so what will help? And I said, well, come over to the house and take some mullein leaves home with you. So she came over, she got a few mullein leaves. She just boiled them some water, put the leaves in the water, steeped the leaves for a while, and then her friend drank the tea. And within 24 hours, she was not coughing at all. Um, so mullein is a good expectorant. It helps break up the mucus in your lungs so that you can easily cough up what's gotten stuck in there. Um, what else about mullein? The leaves are hairy and very soft. So when it grows in the wild, if you're a hiker, you have to uh, uh, use, the, use the bathroom and there's no bathroom around. Mullein leaves make really good soft toilet paper. This is plantain. There are several varieties. There is a broadleaf plantain, which is this picture. There is a narrow leaf plantain where the leaves are very skinny and come to a point. That's Lanceolata. Uh, there's also a variety that is harvested for its seeds. If you've ever taken, um, uh, what's it called? There's a laxative product on the market, um, so, something Musil something. Anyway, the, it's the the plantain seeds they've used. Uh, it, it's called psyllium. The the fiber that's in the in the seeds is a really good laxative, mild laxative. Other than that, this variety of plantain, the lanceolata, probably all of the varieties are good alterative herbs, which means they restore you to health and vitality over a long period of time. Their action is very mild. So you can take this herb over an extended period of time and over that period of time it restores health and vitality. Plantain is also really good for blood poisoning. It is a deobstruent, de which means, and I've used this several times, I've used plantain several times to help pull up slivers out you turn plantain into an ointment and put the ointment on your finger that has a sliver in it, cover it. Um, within a few hours or overnight, um, that sliver has, you know, I've, I've seen it, you know, pull the, the sliver out so that you can easily grab onto it and get rid of it. Very good for uh, snake, venomous snake bites. If you know who Doc Jones is, Dr. Patrick Jones, a veterinarian and clinical herbalist out in the Twin Falls area, likes to tell the story of a friend of his who's a survivalist, who, uh, I mean, he likes to go out into the wild with just a loincloth and climb around and live off the land kind of thing. Well, he was, he was climbing a cliff face, reached his hand up, there happened to be a rattlesnake there, he got bit. He remembered he had seen some plantain growing by a stream bed down below, so he climbs down, he goes over to the stream bed, camps out there for about 24 hours, chews up the leaves, applies them to the, the snake bite until the, the, the wad turns black and then he replaced it. He just continued to do that and chewed on the, the plantain leaves and sucked the juice out of those leaves and in 24 hours he was good to go and he was back to doing his wild man thing. So really good for um, poisonous, venomous snake or spiders like the hobo spider. Um, really good for lots of different things. You'll have, to, you'll have to take a look at my reference manual to see all that it's good for. Puncture vine, goat heads. There's a reason they call this tribulus terrestris. Um, 
The, the goat heads, the, the seed pods on this plant are very sharp. They will puncture tires. They will go through flip-flops and, and thin-soled sandals. Um, they hurt. They've got five really strong, sharp points on those seed pods that are, uh, they really hurt when you step on them. They are, because, because of that, they are easily tracked around on the bottom of your shoe, which helps this plant spread. And it's, it's another one of those uh, tenacious plants that says, I've got medicine, I'm not just dangerous, I've got good medicine, so pay attention. It's a really good cardiovascular herb. It is used by athletes sometimes for uh, building their endurance. It is also used for sexual enhancement. It um, enhances testosterone production. It's good for both men and women for um, sexual enhancement of the, the hormones. Purslane is one of the few plants on the earth that is really high in omega-3 fatty acids. Really healthy plant because of its omega-3 content. It's also really good for cardiovascular health and digestive upsets and complaints. It is very edible. You can add this. It's, a, it's kind of a succulent plant. It's very watery, uh, sort of like cactus plants hold on to water. Purslane holds on to water. You can put it in salads and smoothies, throw it into soups and stews. Really good edible plant. has kind of a sour taste to it. It's not bad, but it's a little on the sour side. Next up, we, had, we have red clover. This is another plant that is good for your liver. It helps the, the liver purify the blood, helps fight cancer. It is kind of a, it's more on the sweet tasting side, so it makes a really delicious tea. The leaves, there are lots of different kinds of clover, alfalfa there, and red clover are in the same family, so before they bloom, it is hard to identify, you know, is this clover, is this alfalfa? If you look at the leaves real close, you'll see a white chevron, kind of a pointy, almost arrowhead-like shape on the white spot on the red clover leaves, and that's how you tell the difference between alfalfa and red clover leaves. The the blossoms actually have the medicine in this plant, easy to harvest, uh, beautiful when they dry and sit in a, in a jar on the shelf. Uh, really good plant to have on hand. Fast growing, comes back every year. It's also edible. Shepherd's Purse. This is a really hardy annual weed. Um, it springs up in the early spring, and it will also come back in uh, late summer, early fall. Shepherd's Purse is a really good um, herb. Lots of midwives keep it on hand for, um, for, for childbirth. It'll stop, it'll help stop bleeding after childbirth. It's also really good for acute urinary infections. Uh, just a really good medicinal to have on hand. The whole plant is the medicine. The, the seed pods, you can't really see in this picture, but on my website I show a close-up. The seed pods have kind of a heart shape, really kind of cute. Um, I remember when we first moved here and I was looking at the, the plants that grow here, I found a, a lone shepherd's purse out in the, the driveway area of the house. And I hadn't seen it before. So I looked real close and I noticed that it had these heart-shaped seed pods. And I, I remembered from my Master Herbal Studies that to look for that seed pod. And, and I thought, oh, I wonder if this is Shepherd's Purse. And so I found some pictures online and did some comparison. And yeah, it was Shepherd's Purse. So that was pretty exciting to discover that I had Shepherd's Purse on the property. And now it's, it's everywhere. The, the seed pods mature sequentially. So as, 
as the, the plant flowers, and it starts putting out flowers real early in the spring when the stems are only uh, like two inches high. And, and the, the stem will continue to grow and produce uh, these little blossoms on the sides of the stems that turn into these heart-shaped seed pods. And, um, and as those seeds mature, the seeds are shed and this will spread everywhere, which is, it's a good thing because it's a really good medicinal plant, really good for stopping bleeding. Showy milkweed. This is one of the, the plants that has a white milky sap in it. So if, if you want to collect the, that milky sap and make a tincture out of it to, har to, to take advantage of that uh, me medicine, um, it was herbalist Michael Moore from uh, the New Mexico area, clinical herbalist, He's written a couple of really good books on uh, identifying the, the medicinal plants that grow in different parts of the United States. Um, he said, if you want to harvest the milky sap, find a big stand of these plants, get a chair with a, a sun umbrella and a big bottle of water and a good book to read, and you, you cut off the top of the stem of the, the plants and, and let the, the milky sap come out. And when it hardens, you pluck it off and, and collect it in a bowl. And then you cut those stems about an inch down and let the milky sap come out and let it harden and then collect those, the, the hard bumps of the milky sap. And, and you do this one inch at a time down this plant. And these plants will grow three to four feet tall so it's kind of an all day thing, but that's how you harvest the milky sap from these plants. It's a really good uh, respiratory for, for lung conditions, a really good tonic herb for respiratory lung conditions. Helps with digestion, and because it has the milky, white milky sap, it's, it's a, an age old remedy for getting rid of warts. Um, showy milkweed is also a really good plant. The flowers attract butterflies and other pollinator insects to your garden, so it's a really good one to have on hand. Wild lettuce, wild uh, prickly lettuce, wild prickly lettuce. I've been told this plant has several names, uh, but it's a weed that grows everywhere where we live. Um, it is a mild analgesic and sedative and is also good for uh, dropsy or what, you know, an old fashioned name for water retention. The way you identify this plant is you look on the underside of the leaf. It has a very pronounced midrib. And if you look at this picture on your screen really closely, you can see the midrib has these tiny prickles. They're, they're stiff. They're sharp-ish. They're they're not gonna make you bleed. I don't think if you uh, you know if if you touch them, but they're prickly, and that's how you identify this plant. Uh, the 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 lobes of the leaves are very jagged and irregular in shape. It grow this plant can grow six to seven feet tall. Really hard to get out of your garden if you let it get that far. If you if you want to weed it out. Uh, it grow, it uh, gets small yellow daisy-like flowers at the very top, and that will. Uh, I think one of the the look-alikes is the some of the thistle plants, very similar. These plants are the ancestors of our garden lettuce. They are um, wild prickly lettuce is bitter, so it's a good digestive. It does produce uh, white milky sap as well. The, the leaves are edible. Um, they can eat, be eaten raw or cooked if, you know, kind of a survival food. If you had nothing else, you could survive on it, but not really that good to eat. Quick story, I know we're, we're pretty much out of time, but I've only got a couple more herbs to 
to share with you. Um, I was I was at a preparedness fair, had a had a booth, had a young teenage boy come up to me and and start questioning me about herbs. Said, "Do you know what wild lettuce is?" And I said, "Yeah, that's a really good herb." And he said that his dad used it. Uh, this little this young boy had had surgery on his toe, and he was in a lot of pain. And so his dad went out and made a tea with the the wild lettuce, and he drank the tea, and the pain subsided. So a really good analgesic for uh, pain relief. That was a fun story. Fun sh story that he shared with me. Wild sheep sorrel. There's a French Canadian nurse. I think she has since passed away, but she developed a an herbal remedy that helped cancer patients get rid of cancer. So her recipe is all over the internet. Uh, sheep sorrel, the, the roots of sheep sorrel are the key ingredient in that recipe. The trick is to the remedy is that the you need to use three-year-old roots. So I am in the process of growing three small patches of wild sheep sorrel. So when I have three-year-old roots, I can harvest those start a new patch of wild sheep sorrel and the next year I'll have roots that I can harvest. You know, it's just kind of a rotation kind of thing. Uh, good plant to have on hand. It is anti-inflammatory. I guess it has lots of other good um, medicinal values that you'll have to take a look at on my website or in my herbal reference manual. But its claim to fame is being a cancer remedy. Uh, sheep sorrel and yellow dock are cousins. They have flower stalks that look very similar. Uh, yellow dock in the it's really hard to find yellow dock in the spring because it just it blends in so well with the the native grasses and weeds that grow here around here. But when you see these brownish reddish brown flower stalks in the fall, late summer, early fall, is like, oh, there's the yellow dock. The root is the medicine. The The root is yellow. It has a lot of berberine in it. It has a really good high iron content. So if you are anemic or pregnant and need to boost your iron, yellow dock is the plant to do that. The root is the medicine and the stronger the yellow color, the stronger the medicine. This plant loves to grow n near <clears throat> sources of water but when it does that the root is almost white so in this <clears throat> for the medicine in this plant to be potent you need to find the plant that's kind of up on the hill where the water you know when it does get water that water drains away and that stresses the plant a little bit which makes the medicine. So there you have it, 20 common weeds. But those 20 common weeds have over 100 health benefits that I've cited in my herbal reference manual. Uh, there is more detailed information than I've given this morning on my website, which you can see here, thebackyardherbalistschool.com. And my reference manuals have the greatest detail. And those are available at ldsprepperstore.com. Questions? Do we have questions? Yeah. We have questions. Well, David's coming back in. This is a picture of my herb garden. My in addition to the herbs that that and weeds that grow here on the property, I have a, an herb garden where I cultivate a lot of what does not grow here. So between what I grow, what I cultivate, and what grows here naturally, I have a lot of medicine in my backyard. And it has been really fun learning about these plants, just one herb at a time, and becoming acquainted with the powerful medicine that they have.
Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for your comments and your questions. Uh, very helpful. Uh, let me just go full screen here so that uh, they can see us a little bit better. And I'm just going to go to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so first question was. Uh, in her reference books, does she go further into which part of the plants to use and how to prepare and use them? Yes, really good question. I do indicate what, uh, what parts are used medicinally. I include color photographs, uh, primary and secondary health benefits, and then all of the lesser, less common health benefits uh, from that plant, uh, culinary and nutritional value, um, how to grow it, and what uh, contraindications, some safety um, tips, recommendations, how to stay safe, um, and then the, the best way to make that plant into medicine. So some plants tincture well, some plants do not. Some plants are better taken as teas. All that kind of information is in my herbal reference manual. Okay, so she has four reference manuals. Today we've talked about uh, medicinal weeds. Can you just kind of just quickly show them some of the pages and some of the content? Uh, I think people really like being able to see that they uh, that there's pictures in there so they can take this out with them in the field or in the backyard and identify plants. Yep, each, each section begins with a good picture, the best picture I could find of the plant. It's hard to capture the whole plant in a photograph, but you know what identifies the plant the best is there. A smaller picture is there. Um, actually, there's better identification information on my website that you can take a look at. Um, so, lots of information about the medicinal value of each plant, um, how, how, to grow, how to grow and cultivate these plants, herbal remedies. I've also got recipes, so if these plants are edible, uh, you, there are some recipes that you can try uh, to add that into your everyday meals. That's good. All right, excellent. So, lots of information, again, uh, this is one of her four books that's available at ldsprepperstore.com. You actually get a you can you can purchase a digital download and, and look at it today. You can get a digital download or a physical copy, um, or you can just get a physical copy. Uh, she also has a discount when you buy all four reference manuals. So the other manuals that she has available are her uh, backyard herbalist first aid herbs, which is really really good. Another one, one of our very uh, popular ones here is the healer's art on how to make uh, basic remedies. And then uh, if you like cooking with herbs, and who doesn't, right? That makes the food taste good. Here is her culinary herb uh, reference manual. So all those are available. Lots of detail in those books. And it looks like we ha really have a lot of people here today who are, are very interested in uh, herbal uh, applications, remedies, how to use them, and so forth. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Another question is, can you eat lamb's quarter raw? Yes. Yes, you can. Just like you can eat spinach raw, lamb's quarters can be eaten raw. Okay. Another question is, do you give one-on-one well, -on -one or group classes here in the area? I do. I will do an early spring plant walk to help people learn to identify the medicinal weeds as they're just starting to germinate uh, because a lot of the plants are easily confused when they just have a very, their first true leaves. A lot of those early weeds look a lot alike. So um, I do an early spring plant walk to help you identify those plants that are coming up and then I'll do an early summer plant walk to show the progress of those plants, show the, the spring weeds on their way out, and the early summer plants as they're starting to come into 
uh, germination and their early stages of growth. And I also do herbal remedy workshops. That's a real, those are really popular. A lot of people want to know, you know, when, when, you know, now that I've got these plants growing here, how do I turn them into medicine? So I do that and uh, I'm considering some other more advanced herbal classes as well. So if people want to attend your class, is there a class schedule? Is there somewhere that they can go to register? I have an email list of those who are interested in my classes. So if you go, if you just send me an email, sue at ldsprepper.com, I'll get you on my email list. And I, I just, you know, anytime you hear of local herbal classes, I've got a friend who likes to do beginning herbal remedy classes. Um, so anytime there's a local class going on, I just send out a quick email saying, hey, this is what's going on and provide registration information. So I don't spam you with a, an email a week kind of, kind of deal. It's just to let you know what's going on, what you can take advantage of. Okay. Living exclamation mark uh, says thank you for the presentation, but she also wants to know if you can harvest plantain too early. I don't think so. The medicines in the plant, typically, the way you tell how to harvest a plant, or where, when the medicine is potent, is you kind of think like a plant. In the early spring, the plant is putting its energy into leaf and stem growth. And then it's going to put its energy into flower, into the flowers, and then into the seeds so it can reproduce. And then in the fall, if it's a perennial, it'll put its energy back into the roots to overwinter. So you harvest the leaves in the spring when they are new and young and fresh and have the most energy in them. You, you harvest flowers just as they are starting to bloom. That's when they have the most potent medicine. You harvest uh, the seeds when they are mature. You harvest the roots in the fall of the first year or early spring of the second year if they're perennials. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Okay, Chris uh, Shippack said, I just ordered all four books of yours. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your information and your knowledge over the internet and in books. God bless you. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Living Explanation Mark says, thank you. Just put uh, your, your books in a cart on the site. Uh, looks looking at the other products uh, by the way uh, you know these these plants are medicinal for sure but you can also uh, make them nutritional and we and uh, I always tell people only feed the plants that you want to grow and this is the LDS prepper micronutrient mix this has molybdenum manganese copper zinc uh, nitrogen phosphorus potassium all the trace and macronutrients that every plant on the planet needs. So if you're growing herbs in your garden, definitely want to feed them a, a, a mixture of the LDS Prepper uh, micronutrient mix along, uh, mix that into a, a, a plant food. So you can get that on the website. And if you're into gardening, uh, certainly check out uh, ldsprepper.com because about half the videos, about 500 of the videos, are about gardening. This is our one uh, book that we use when uh, not only is Sue a certified master herbalist, but she's also a certified master gardener. And when we moved from Texas, she literally donated a thousand dollars, all of her basically all of her gardening books, over a thousand dollars worth of books that she had purchased over the years, and kept this twenty-five dollar book. This book is our gardening bible. It's available at ldsprepperstore.com. I uh, personally autograph them uh, before they go out. So if you want to buy the micronutrients, the, the books, your Berkey water filters, Sue's reference manuals for the herbs, those are all available at uh, ldsprepperstore.com. I have links down below this video to her herbal uh, school website, and I have links down below this video for her um, manuals at ldsprepperstore.com. Com. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Doctor, first of all, I need to say, Doc Michael, thank you very much for all the invitations you sent out. So many people here today 
are here because of your presentation, uh, because of your post. So thank you so much. Sue will be here for the next three weeks. And next week she's going to be talking about... You want to do first aids or first aid? First aid. So this is the real application, you know, how to use these in a first aid uh, um, situation. So she'll be going over uh, the information from that uh, book. It's great that you're here live because you can ask these questions. You know, can you harvest plantain too early? Great question. I don't know that that's even covered in the book, but she talks about, you know, like she mentioned, just think like a plant. And so uh, yeah, being. It is covered in the book. Okay, so being live is, is great here um, so that you can ask those questions. So let's see. Uh, if I give us a nutrient. Let's see. Um, all right. It says, uh, Doc Michael says, I've been following that book best uh, I can, best I can for a couple years. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let everybody else know that uh, next week Sue will be back here. Let everybody know about this post here uh, so they can come back and view it. Uh, God has provided these plants. When you find a weed, that's, that's the plant saying, hey, look at me. Uh, I'm hard to kill because I'm here to bless you. So uh, what we typically call weeds are really uh, beneficial for the family. So get familiar with these learn how to use them, learn how to make tinctures and ointments and so forth. Um, Sue will be going over all of that also in the third uh, presentation out of the four, so uh, two weeks from today. So uh, subscribe to the channel, click the uh, bell notification so that you know when we post next uh, week, uh, so you'll have a notification that she'll be back on. Thank you very much for being here. This is LDS Prepper. And the backyard herbalist saying, if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. Have a great day. Thank you.